Welcome to the Business of Design podcast. I'm Cheryl Horn, Director of Operations for Business of Design. A lot has changed at Business of Design since this episode originally aired. For the latest information and rates on events and membership at Business of Design, head to businessofdesign.com. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome to Business of Design, episode 148. We're going to have a conversation that I've never really thought consciously about, and it has to do with designing for the senses. When was the last time you sat down and actually thought about your client or customer experience in terms of the five senses, sight, sound, scent, touch, and even taste? Designer Andrew Richmond reached out to me. He mostly does a commercial food and beverage or F&B but he has a background as well in customer experience in terms of websites. So his insights in terms of how to think about that client experience were really interesting and got me reconsidering the qualifying conversation I'll be having with clients during the design process. And this is what occurred to me in terms of decorating with the senses. The holidays just passed and people have in general very strong feelings about the holidays and what is expected in terms of the experience, the familial experience. So in other words, if you are used to always having a fresh tree and you suddenly switch to a fake tree, you might get resistance from the rest of the family. They miss the smell. They miss the experience of the needles falling and all that kind of stuff. If you always make banana pudding and that is the family favorite holiday treat and this year you decide to do chocolate mousse, you're going to get some pushback because people are used to the experience of that banana pudding. I connected years ago that the holidays have so much meaning in terms of the food, the decorating, et cetera, because all the senses are involved in holiday decorating. It's not just how it looks, right? It's how it smells. It's how it sounds. It's how things taste. It's all of it. And so given that, why wouldn't I be more intentional in terms of my client experience with the sense as well? After spending several years as the design director at a design agency, Andrew Richmond noticed a disconnect in the market, and he realized that so many restaurants were hiring one firm to do the creative and design, and then a totally different firm for brand development. And since he had those two hats already, he wanted to create a more cohesive experience. And he did that with Model Citizen. Model Citizen with Andrew at the helm innovates in creating meaningful and original experiences for patrons, mostly, as I said, in the food and beverage industry. One of his recent projects I haven't seen yet, but I'd like to, is for Nestle's Kit Kat. It's a chocolatory at a popular shopping mall, Yorkdale Shopping Center in Toronto. So that's one I'd love to see. And as you're listening to Andrew, what is running through my mind has to do with being more intentional around the senses and presenting myself to clients as the expert who can curate all of that. Hmm, lots to think about on this episode. Sight, scent, touch, sound, and taste. And you, my friend, have great taste because here you are listening to Business of Design and we're very grateful. Quick announcements and then we'll jump into the show. Hey, Janine, how are you? Hey, Kimberly, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing a lot better than poor Cheryl, who is at home with a miserable cold. I know, I talked to her today, and she is out of commission with a cold, but she had some really cool stuff to share with us. She wanted everyone to know that there are just two spots left for the upcoming Business of Design conference in Las Vegas, and she's had lots of inquiries. So we just want to encourage everybody to get signed up. If you're on the fence and you're thinking about it, get signed up. We're going to have such a great time, and we're really excited. I think... um... And, you know, of course, I put my heart and soul, as we all do, into every conference we do. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is the best conference we've ever done. And in the past, when we've done conferences, we've gotten 100% on our scorecard from those who've attended. So the bar is pretty high, but I, for one, am really excited about it. And looking forward to having some fun in Las Vegas with our sponsor, Build Lane, who's hosting a swishy cocktail party as well. So two spots left. 
But Janine, if they miss out on the conference, we're already looking to October for the Elite Retreat Palm Springs. Exactly. We have another great Elite Retreat in the works for October back in Palm Springs. Some of you joined us a couple of years ago. It is phenomenal. Um, we'd love to see you in Vegas, but that if that doesn't work for you, think about Palm Springs. It's going to be amazing. I'm looking forward to both. Janine, thank you so much. I'll see you in Vegas. Okay. See you in Vegas. Woo woo. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Business of Design is the coaching community for independent designers like you. We know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses, participate in monthly coaching calls, and find unlimited support within our exclusive members-only Facebook group. Unlike traditional coaching, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $79. Annual members save two months. What are you waiting for? We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. And now, back to the show. Hey, Andrew, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Oh, I was excited to have you. I, you came up with a topic idea that we've never explored before, and that's just, I don't think that's easy to do when you're looking at around 150 episode, episodes so far. Right, so, right, right, right. Thank you, but I was intrigued by this idea of designing for all the senses. I have to cop to never thinking about that, not consciously. I mean, sight is a given. Obviously, it's important to me what things look like, but I definitely don't ever remember consciously thinking of the other senses. How did you even how did you even come to considering that in a cohesive way? I come from a background in user experience design. Um, so in doing that, you really kind of think about how intuitive a design is or the usability of something you're creating is to the end user. I then in my career kind of progressed into full-on design of spaces, environmental design, interior design. Um, and when I come into a space, I, I do stand back and think about what is the, and we'll call it customer experience. That's kind of a very robotic term, but um, kind of thinking about how people are going to feel when they come into that space. Um, what are you doing in that space? What are you offering? If it is a retail or um, food and beverage environment, how's it going to smell? How's it going to sound? How's it going to feel? And how's it going to look? So this is kind of fascinating. So you actually came from a user experience branding website world, and then you went into design. And so that must be a huge advantage as you're talking to customers, particularly, I would think, for commercial F&B. Yeah, and I mean, it goes even further back. I mean, it's just always been centered around design, what I've done in my career and in my life. Um, uh, there has been um, fashion design, there's been some graphic design, there's been some user experience design, there's been some interior design, and also concept development. So I'm also an owner-operator of, of uh, many food and beverage establishments that exist, as well as Model Citizen, which does branding and interior design for the food and beverage and retail space. So kind of in that world, it's kind of just been me across many, um, across a large landscape of design execution. Very cool. Okay, so we're going to focus on the interior design aspect. But tell yep. me, for those of us, because most of the listeners, I'm assuming 95% of the listeners are more interior residential. That that might be a little high. Maybe it's 85% of the listeners. So let's just yep. focus on the principles to consider when you're designing for a client in order to provide spaces, I assume, that are more deeply satisfying because you've considered all of the senses. Yeah, I mean, again, you can apply this thinking to a uh, home execution 110%. It's, it's all about, I mean, when, when I'm dealing with food and beverage, it's thinking about the customer, it's thinking about the person that's going to be in that experience and how they're going to feel with all their senses. It's the same thing you're going to feel at home. You are the customer at home or people that you bring into your house. And I actually think it's not a bad idea to even back up and consider customer experience. Why wouldn't I consider client experience when I'm designing a kitchen or a bedroom? Right? I do think about that. I think about what is the mood and the feeling I'm trying to create. And that, I guess, is the customer experience. Uh, absolutely. And, and you said client experience, customer or client experience. Exactly. Because 
at the end of the day, it's all about feeling. Design is about feeling, and that feeling isn't just through sight. It's through smell. It's through sight. It's through um, textures. It's through colors. It's through it's through so many things, and that's why I bring um, our tie back to the senses, and it's more than just sight. Yeah. Okay, well, we definitely are going to talk about the category of sight, but because I feel like that seems so obvious to all of us, let's move on yep. to the others, the other senses first, the overlooked senses, I would say, in my case. Um, let's talk about scent. What can we do? What do we think about when we're in designing those spaces for clients in order to maximize that client experience? What do we think about in terms of scent? In scent as in smell? Correct. Correct. I okay. thought smell so, sounded like a bad word. Like, let's talk about <laughs> smells. I just didn't think that sounded right. So I went with I went with a more upscale scent. <laughs> and, and 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 again, um, when we're dealing with a retail space, obviously that's taken um, into consideration. You often will go into places in a mall, and they'll have a scent that is in their location. Some are executed well, some are not executed so well. When you're trying to sell a house, for example, I know people bake cookies in their oven, um, things like that. It is a sense that maybe goes under the radar, but definitely impacts the feeling that you have when you walk into a space. Um, yeah, sorry, you were going to say something? I was going to say that I also think there are, if in our case, maybe you don't have a signature scent for the spaces you design, but I certainly have candles that are my favorite candle in the whole world, and I will give those to clients and say, burn no other candles, please. <laughs> this is it. One of my, this one is of your my one candle. Is- is Aesop. It's a company out of Scandinavia. I'm sure you're aware of them, but they have some really interesting sensory um, experiential stuff that they sell through the location. So I've used that in not only food and beverage locations, but even at my own home. So that's yeah. kind of I'm a big, that a little further. I use Aesop um, hand soaps and hand creams. They're the best ever. And um, But my favorite... And that actually is an amazing point right there is hand soap. That's a huge one, and that is considered a lot in food and beverage, but at home as well. Massively. Well, right. And otherwise, left to their own de- devices, clients may run out and buy something at the local grocery store or, you know, or their cousin gave them something for the holidays, which smells like, you know, a fruit explosion. Um, so I do kind of like to curate those things, but I've never really thought about it in terms of scent. I have to tell everybody my favorite candle. And it really is more of it's really more of my favorite winter in Toronto candle, which is the Diptyque Feu de Bois. That is my signature go-to candle. I find the men like it and the women like it. In the for yep. the for springtime and for summer, I will go to the fig candle. I think that one works. I don't know if you have another yep. favorite. Yep. Well, I, I, it's funny you said curation of of and just speaking about the smells and spaces and this is all part and parcel of. One of the layers of interior design that I that I look at, it's one of the last ones. It's the dressing of a space or the curation of the smaller elements that build and layer on top of your foundational design of any space. So curating um, the hand soap is one key one that we always, it kind of gets layered on right at the end, but it's something that we think about in any space that we're developing. I'm actually thinking now of other things too. What about dish soap or... Um, what are, are there, I guess, laundry soap. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have a conversation with your client and say, you know, some clients are interested in my opinion on these things and I would recommend the yeah, following yeah. products for your home. Um, I just think it inherently happens in a lot of people's design, but when you step back and actually look at it as a larger body of work, it's kind of interesting. Well, yeah, and if you attack it with intention, imagine the perception to clients of, a conversation early in the design process about how the home is going to smell. And these are some yeah. products that I would like to make sure you have on hand. We will bring them to you during the styling process if you prefer. Um, exactly, exactly. And yeah. have that conversation. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I guess I would have to also say in the category of scent, we've got to talk about what not to do in a home, right? Because there are some products that off gas and, you know, just provide absolutely, you know, absolutely, the opposite yeah. of what you want. So do you know off the top of your head, Andrew, what those products might be that you just want clients to not have to experience the smell of? Um, uh, aggressive rubbers. 
<laughs> I really don't like that. Yeah. I think you nailed it with some off-gassing thing. I think it would all depend on on what it is specifically we're talking about. There's definitely some things from a, um, a smell perspective that are just unappealing. And you know, you'd obviously want to stay away from those. I can't really speak to one. Well, I guess paint, right? And stains. Those are obvious. Flooring is a big one. Carpet sometimes or an engineered hardwood, even rubbers, of course, as you mentioned. Wow. Okay, this like happens to me all the time doing this podcast. Now I'm suddenly considering how I have to incorporate this conversation early into the design process and revamp everything. Like, oh my gosh, this is, yeah, wow. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and even 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 sound, sound's another one. So sound, obviously, we think about that on a customer perspective when we're talking food and beverage and retail. It's very important to the feeling of any given space. But even down to a large room with hard walls and how's the sound going to bounce and what kind of audio system you're using, is it going to be Sonos? And there's just so many questions around sound and how you want to feel and how warm the sound should be and the, the, the conversation between low and high-end sound. Um, a lot of people tend to go a little higher on the high end. I like to go very heavy on the low end, not for volume, but for feeling in your gut when you're walking through a space. So does We're that... talking a little bit more louder. Does Sorry. that mean more bass when you say you like to go on the low, low end? Low end, I, 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 bass is an aggressive term, but that's exactly what it is. I just call it low end. It's just, it's. I like it to be heavier on the low end. And again, it's not for volume. It's for um, the feeling that it gives someone in their soul when they're listening to whatever it is they're listening to. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to flush yeah. that out a little bit in my life. So again, it's a conversation you'd have early with a client about how a space is going to sound. And then I've had those clients, you probably have too, who say, well, we don't want any drapes. We don't, we don't like drapes. We don't need drapes for privacy. And then that's a really good time to talk about acoustics of a room. If you have a room with 32 surfaces of marble and no draperies and no exactly. area carpets. Yep. Yep. And and that's a big thing. And we one deal sec, with that one a sec. lot. In, Can you hear the siren? Yep. Speak, I did hear the siren. Speaking yeah. of sound. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not have those um, sounds and, and in also, our clients' homes. Also down to, to noise dampeners, which we've had to put in spaces before, but you have to work that into the design, whether it's a fabric that goes over top of it that's motifed to the palette that is the space you're dealing with there's there's lots of things to consider on how to execute these things and how they're going to look in the end product so what do we and, do and, as and noise add. dampening besides carpet and drapes what sort of treatments can we do for example on ceilings yeah there's there's panels you can put on the ceiling and that's traditionally what we've had to use because we've had to separate sound between floors most often than not um and so there's stuff you can buy if you search online you'll find them but there's sound dampening panels and they often come with a fabric exterior but you're you have the ability to change those fabrics change those colors and and kind of augment them as you see fit um often i will clad them in something but the idea is to um just make that work with your space and if anything maybe it becomes a design element maybe a light comes out of it we did a project recently where the contractor told me there's actually a drywall that has more of a sound dampening quality, which we used in a client's basement. They had four children, and oh, wow. I found the, the room super noisy, and he said, we should do that. It was more expensive, but when I pitched it to the clients, they said, please, yes, anything. Yeah, we'll pay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and again, it, it's all about the execution, and, and, and so there it is. Sound is, is a big one, I find. Sound's... Obviously, again, I go back to the fact that I work a lot in food and beverage, so you're dealing with multiple customers in one space at one given time. So sound is a big part of that. But um, yeah. Well, I can tell you as a female in her 50s that when I go to a restaurant now that's so loud, I can't even speak to the person beside me. It, the experience is ruined. And I don't know if it's because, you know, at that over the 50 hump, your ears are more sensitive um, but I'm definitely at the point where I really notice those kinds of things. And I, I guess, you know, the restaurants may even make a decision that they are catering to a super young crowd and they want it to be like ear blasting, you know, madness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. but certainly some and of the restaurants we've been to are definitely not trying to cater to that crowd. And yet you can't even speak to your partner sitting beside you. And I think that that's been, that's been a trend that's been going on now for started about eight years ago. The super loud, um, almost 
boisterous environment within a space. And it, and it does add to the energy of the room. But I think we're going to see a shift go the other way a little bit in terms of peeling that back a bit and maybe making it a bit more hospitable to the customer. I personally feel like that might be a trend that we're going to see happening hmm. moving forward. I didn't realize that was intentional. I like the idea of energetic and boisterous, but not so loud. I can't speak to the people at my table. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I find when I'm when I'm designing in food and beverage, as opposed to a residential space, you can be a little bit more self indulgent in how you execute things because you're making it for someone to come in and be wowed for only a short amount of time, rather than when you're in your personal space, you've got to be there all the time. So it, there's restraint there, I think. Or it's a bit, such I a find. good point. Yeah, that's really such a good point. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about the sense. We talked about sound. Uh, what about yeah. touch? Let's talk about touch. What are the kinds of things we want to touch. think about? Yeah. So best example pops into my head right now is when you come down in the morning, it's breakfast time, you sit down at your table and you put your arms on wherever you're going to eat and it's freezing cold. Yes. Um, that, that, Thank that, you. That's, that's one thing. Thank you. Um, when I have clients who have a big glass window or clients who yeah. live in Toronto, they have a big glass window and they want a glass table. I'm like, or a marble table, you will not be able to sit there from January to May without being freezing. Can I be real with you right now? I'm not one of the spaces I designed, and I said that because my arms are on the table and it's freezing. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Anyway. Thank I, you. I, yeah, go stay at the Paramount in New York. I did that years ago when it first yeah. opened, and I'm like, okay, I'm so cold. I think I want to die in this room. It's so cold. I wanted yeah, to go yeah. out and buy faux fur everything and just wrap my body um, in it. Horrible. But another thing, it's, it's anything tactile. Um, from a design perspective, again, back to the curation and dressing, it's, it's your plateware. There's matted plateware. There's, there's, there's glazed plateware. Um, carpets versus hardwood floor versus porcelain tile. Like, there's just so many textural elements. Texture and feel is so important to the eye and to the physical touch. It's not just the physical touch. It's the eye as well. And again, you can approach the conversation intentionally with clients and point out those products that you're suggesting that have a great touch and a great feel. Mm -hmm. I will often point out how hardware feels. I'll say, I love this doorknob. I love how it feels in my hand. Or I exactly. love how this faucet yep. feels. Yep. And yep. Um, clients are often, oh, I didn't think of that. I didn't think of it consciously. And when you point it out, they go, yeah, actually, it's really... It's got a lovely heaviness to it. Yeah, I like it. So as well, it was, yeah. a, a really good example of that is chairs, um, whether it's a leather seat or a cushion seat or a wooden seat, a flat wooden seat or a seat that has a little divot in it for your butt cheeks. So touch yeah. is about roughness versus softness and just the subtle Rough. feeling of everything the client will experience in their home. It's the texture as well. Obviously, touch is, is, is a thing, but also through you can you can see textures through looking at stuff. Right. Um, again, plateware, a gloss versus a matte plateware are two different feels, and they're also two different looks. In your world of FNB, of course, you do think about taste. I don't know that yep. that necessarily comes into play when you're designing for residential spaces. I think the two worlds really kind of feed off each other. Plating a dish is about design just as much as much as it's about culinary execution. I, I really do believe that from a textural standpoint, from a plating the food onto the dish standpoint, from how the customer is going to see the dish and then the taste. It all kind of goes part and parcel and it's just a whole bunch of the same muscles in the brain being used to give the best product possible. Well, and if you're talking about, um, when I think of plating and I'm working in clients' home, almost always I will push for all white dishes and then... Yeah. If, you know, if there's money in their storage, let's do a patterned, you know, dessert plate or let's do a patterned bread plate to make it more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Or then you can get into the non, um, like the matte finished plates in, in earth tones that are just beautiful. Like think Noma or very Scandinavian looks that like it's just, there's some really gorgeous pottery and interesting things you can um, put into your house that aren't traditional. Wow. Okay. I am like, I realize it's been a long time since I've bought all the dishes for a client and that's a really fun thing to do. So I think I'm going to have to like figure out how to discuss this up front and just say, you know what, because honestly, leave it, it with it, me. 
it, it depends on your execution. You could design a kitchen so that the dishes are one of the focal points as a person walks into the space. And that could be a thing. And you could sell an idea on that fact and then build into your um, execution that you have to be part of the decision making of all the dishes. But, I mean, there's a way to build that into your design as one of the pillars of that design, right? Oh, yeah, I really agree with that. That's amazing. Okay, so then we kind of skipped over the one that seems the most obvious, but maybe there are factions of site as a sense that we're not really tuned into. We, you know, yeah, we all know we want that. spaces to look good, but what else do we want to know about site? Uh, let's go back to lighting. I think it's the most important yeah. thing. Lighting is everything. Lighting, natural light versus incandescent light versus LED light versus dimmers and how much they're going to dim and are they warm to dim and the warmth of light, the coldness of light, just light in general. Such a huge conversation. Custom lighting versus prepackaged lighting versus it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, lighting is very, very, very important. Do you have a magic formula for lighting? Do you start with incandescent and then add other things? Where do you start as you're thinking about designing the lighting? I mean, incandescent, I like warm light. I do not like cold light. It doesn't do anything for me in any of the spaces that I build. Not to say it doesn't have a time and place. I just haven't found that time and place. I like warm light. Um, incandescent is great, but there's some LED executions and from a responsibility standpoint and also just and energy, well, yeah, just it just makes sense to go LED. The the technologies are getting a lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they are. I'm uh, for a long time, I would just be pulling my hair out with dimmers and LED bulbs just not working together very well. Um, and that has clearly changed. I do a lot of my lighting custom, so I work with artists and designers, and we work together and build custom lights for any given space that I'm working on. And again, at the beginning let's say eight years ago, working with LED was a nightmare. It's a lot better now. So I would say I predominantly work with LED. I still do work with incandescent. I also work with neon a lot. Um, and neon gives such a warm glow and such a, and, and I'm talking traditional old school neon, which is, which is really amazing. But at so the end fun. of the day, my, my biggest thing with lighting is low, low lighting and warm lighting and right. natural light whenever possible. Right. I'm thinking in general, when we're working on a design, on the design process, we're thinking about general lighting first and then yep. special lighting secondarily. I wonder if I have that backwards. I wonder if I shouldn't. Do you see, when yeah. you say general lighting, you're talking like track lights, pop lights, that kind of exactly. stuff? Exactly. Like general ambient lighting as opposed to a sculptural yep. chandelier that's going to make or break a space or sconces it's or funny. a reading lamp for example. I, I I agree with that statement, although the last project and the one I'm working on currently, one of a couple I'm working on currently, um, we made it a rule that there was no house lighting. There's only sculptural lighting and, and, and lighting that is meant to be there. Um, yeah, so we've kind of taken all those pot lights and track lights and everything out of the space, and we're just trying to use lighting that's meaningful and thoughtful and the space is never meant to be very light unless it's natural. Right. So it's kind of starts flipping it on its ear a bit, and we'll see how that goes. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to think about that in the house that we're working on right now, like starting with special lighting and then see how little of the other general ambient lighting I can get away with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Anything else we need to think about in terms of sight besides lighting? Do you start with, in a, in a restaurant probably, maybe even more so, I don't know, do you start with some focal point in a space, like this is going to be a feature, so this is we're going to spend a lot of time getting this feature right? Um, you know what? I always try to infuse some level of artistic integration into the spaces, but I always do like to work with local artists and, and friends. They're more often than not friends of mine, and we just kind of get together and collaborate and, and build interesting visual moments in a space. So when someone's walking through, something actually catches their eye and they can have a conversation about it or just take it in. Um, and not in the sense of an Instagram moment. That is not a thing we do. We like to just create spaces that would, if someone wanted to take a picture, they could, but we don't ever shoehorn that into our design. Whoa, tell me more about that. <laughs> I had another <laughs> question ready, but I'm like, go, go dig into that Instagram moment thing for a minute. Uh, it's just a, it's just something that almost everyone that asks you to, to do a design these days asks for, and it's because I think it's yeah they they maybe don't even know 
I don't know. I just don't agree with trying to force a moment on someone. I think it's more of just building and designing a space that inherently has beautiful elements that are going to capture people's attention. I don't think it's about trying to craft one moment. And I don't know. It just seems like the wrong way of thinking to me. It's interesting because I do notice now, uh, particularly um, here in Santa Monica and Los Angeles, I do notice when I walk into commercial spaces sometimes, I'm sort of hit in the face with what looks like to me the Insta moment. I'm like, oh, they're planning for us to have an Insta moment here. And I kind of feel like repelled by it rather than drawn to it. And this is uh, coming from the guy that created a concept called Sweet Jesus, (laughs) which was kind of... um, a media darling in terms of Instagram moments. It was an ice cream thing that we created. Anyway, it's interesting that I'm saying that being someone who created something that was so Instagrammable. But again, these moments are never made because they're forced. I like to just have it be part of the design. If if it, if it happens, it happens great. And usually it does happen because we create great spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's about being authentic really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And just doing good work. Yeah. Well, I think we can all relate to that. Andrew, we like to end every episode with design intervention, a nugget of wisdom you think is essential for designers listening. I think the biggest piece of advice I'd give is get a good accountant and get a good lawyer. The two (laughs) things that I think entering into a contract with anyone, you should have buttoned down. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I think it's just smart business. Yeah, I think you want to protect yourself in this crazy world that we live in. If we have all of those things buttoned down, then we are free to be our best creative selves. But those are the very things, right? The paperwork, the legal hassles, those are the things that disrupt us and take away whatever free time we might have where we could really explore the creative mandate for a project. Exactly. You don't want to get caught up in that that world if, as long as everything's kind of in place and everyone agrees on everything. You can focus on what we love to do, which is creating great spaces. Great advice. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of the Business of Design community. If you love what you hear on the podcast, take the next step by signing up at businessofdesign.com. As our thank you, you'll gain access to Business of Design's 15-step project management strategy, a free introductory course which includes three Business of Design systems you can implement for immediate results. And when you're ready for success, a Business of Design membership, monthly or annual, will dramatically improve your business and your life. What are you waiting for? Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today.